The Miller's Prologue. Here follow the words between the host and the miller. When the knight had thus told his tale, in all the company there was no one young nor old, who did not say it was a noble story, and worthy to draw into memory, and especially the gentlefolk every one. Our host laughed and swore, as I may move about, I swear. This goes well, the bag is opened. Let's see now who shall tell another tale. For truly the game is well begun. Now tell you, Sir Monk, if you can. Something to equal the knight's tale. The miller, who for drunkenness was all pale, so that he hardly sat upon his horse. He would not doff neither hood nor hat, nor give preference to any man out of courtesy. But in Pilate's voice he began to cry, and swore, by Christ's arms, and by blood and bones. I know a noble tale for this occasion, with which I will now requite the knight's tale. Our host saw that he was drunk on ale, and said, Wait, Robin, my dear brother. Some better man shall first tell us another. Wait, and let us act properly. By God's soul, said he, that will not I. For I will speak or else go my way. Our host answered, Tell on, in the devil's name. Thou art a fool, thy wit is overcome. Now listen, said the miller, every one. But first I make a protestation. That I am drunk, I know it by my sound. And therefore if that I misspeak or say, amiss. Blame it on ale of Southwark, I you pray. For I will tell a legend and a life. Both of a carpenter and of his wife. How a clerk has set the carpenter's cap, fooled him. The reeve answered and said, hold your tongue. Let be thy ignorant drunken ribaldry. It is a sin and also a great folly. To slander any man, or defame him. And also to bring wives in such ill fame. Thou canst say enough about other things. This drunken miller spoke very quickly in reply. And said, Dear brother Oswald. He who has no wife, he is no cuckold. But I say not therefore that thou art one. There are very good wives, many a one and ever a thousand good against one bad. Thou knowest that well thyself, unless thou art mad. Why art thou angry with my tale now? I have a wife, by God, as well as thou. Yet I would not, for the oxen in my plough, take upon me more than enough, trouble, as to believe of myself that I were one, a cuckold. I will believe well that I am not one. A husband must not be inquisitive. Of God's secrets, nor of his wife, so long as he can find God's plenty there. Of the rest he needs not inquire. What more should I say, but this miller? He would not refrain from speaking for any man, but told his churl's tale in his manner. I regret that I must repeat it here. And therefore every respectable person I pray. For God's love, think not that I speak. Out of evil intention, but because I must repeat. All their tales, be they better or worse. Or else, I must, falsify some of my material, and therefore, whoever does not want to hear it, turn over the leaf and choose another tale. For he shall find enough, of every sort, of historical matter that concerns nobility, and also morality and holiness. Blame not me if you choose amiss. The miller is a churl, you know this well. So was the reeve also and many others. And ribaldry they told, both of the two. Think about this, and don't blame me. And also people should not take a joke too seriously. The Miller's Tale Here begins the Miller's Tale. There was once dwelling at Oxford, a rich churl, who took in boarders. And of his craft he was a carpenter. With him there was dwelling a poor scholar, who had learned the arts curriculum, but all his desire, was turned to learning astrology. And he knew a certain, number of, of astronomical operations, to determine by scientific calculations. If men asked him, in specific, astronomical, hours, when men should have drought or else showers, or if people asked him what should happen, concerning everything, I cannot reckon them all. This clerk was called Clever Nicholas, of secret love he knew and of its satisfaction, and moreover he was sly and very discreet, and like a maiden meek in appearance. A room had he in that hostelry, alone, without any company, very elegantly strewn with sweet-smelling herbs, and he himself as sweet as is the root, 
of licorice or any zidori, a ginger-like herb, his almagest, and books large and small, his astrolabe, belonging to his art, of astronomy, his counting stones, for his abacus, lie neatly apart, arranged on shelves at his bed's head, his linen press covered with a red woolen cloth, and all above there lay a fine psaltery, on which at night he made melody, so sweetly that all the room rang, and the angel to the virgin he sang, and after that he sang the king's tune, very often his merry throat was blessed, and thus this sweet clerk spent his time, living on his friend's support and his own income. This carpenter had recently wedded a wife, whom he loved more than his life. She was eighteen years of age. Jealous he was, and held her narrowly in confinement. For she was wild and young, and he was old. And believed himself likely to be a cuckold. He knew not Cato, for his wit was rude. Who advised that man should wed his equal. Men should wed according to their status in life. For youth and old age are often in conflict. But since he was fallen in the snare. He must endure, like other folk, his troubles. Fair was this young wife, and moreover. As any weasel was her body graceful, and slender. A belt she wore, with decorative strips all of silk. An apron as white as morning milk. Upon her loins, full of many a flounce. White was her smock, and embroidered all in front. And also behind, around her collar. With coal black silk, within and also without. The ribbons of her white cap, were of the same color as her collar. Her headband broad of silk, and set very high. And surely she had a wanton eye. Her two eyebrows were plucked very thin. And those were bent and black as any slow. She was much more blissful to look upon. Than is the new early ripe pear tree. And softer than the wool is of a sheep and by her girdle hung a purse of leather, tasseled with silk and ornamented with Latin pearls, in all this world, to seek up and down. There is no man so wise that he could imagine, so lovely a little doll or such a wench. Much brighter was the shining of her complexion, than the newly minted noble in the tower, but of her song, it was as loud and lively, as any swallow sitting on a barn. Moreover she could skip and play, like any kid or calf following its mother. Her mouth was sweet as ale and honey or mead, or a hoard of apples laid in hay or heather. Skittish she was, as is a spirited colt, tall as a mast, and straight as an arrow. A brooch she wore upon her low collar, as broad as is the boss of a shield. Her shoes were laced high on her legs. She was a primrose, a pig's eye, a flower, for any lord to lay in his bed or yet for any good yeoman to wed. Now, sir, and again, sir, it so happened, that one day this clever Nicholas, happened with this young wife to flirt and play, while her husband was at Ozenai, for clerks are very subtle and very clever, and intimately he caught her by her crotch, and said, Indeed, unless I have my will, for secret love of thee, sweetheart, I die, and held her hard by the thigh, and said, Sweetheart, love me immediately. Or I will die, so save me God. And she sprang as a colt does when restrained. And with her head she twisted fast away. And said, I will not kiss thee, by my faith. Why, let me be. Said she. Let me be, Nicholas. Take away your hands, for your courtesy. This Nicholas began to cry for mercy. And spoke so fair, and pressed his suit so fast that she granted him her love at the last, and swore her oath, by St. Thomas of Kent, that she will be at his commandment, when she may well espy her opportunity. My husband is so full of jealousy, that unless you wait patiently and are secretive, I know right well I am as good as dead, said she. You must be very secret in this matter. No, care thee not about that, said Nicholas. A clerk had badly wasted his time, studying if he could not outwit a carpenter, and thus they are agreed and sworn, to wait for a time, as I have told before. When Nicholas had done thus every bit, and well patted her about the loins, he kissed her sweetly and takes his psaltery, and plays fast, and makes melody. Then it thus happened, that to the parish church, Christ's own works to do, this good wife went on a holiday, 
Her forehead shone as bright as any day. It was so washed when she left her work. Now was there of that church a parish clerk, who was called Absalom. Curly was his hair, and as the gold it shone, and stretched out like a fan large and broad. Very straight and even lay his elegant parted hair. His complexion was ruddy, his eyes grey as a goose. With St. Paul's window carved on his shoes, in red hose he went elegantly. Clad he was very trimly and properly, all in a tunic of a light blue. Very fair and thick are the laces set, and over that he had a gay surplice, as white as is the blossom upon the branch. A merry lad he was, so save me God. Well could he draw blood, and cut hair and shave, and make a charter of land or a legal release. In twenty different ways could he trip and dance, after the school of Oxford as it was then, and with his legs kick to and fro, and play songs on a small fiddle to which he sometimes sang a loud high treble, and he could play as well on a guitar. In all the town there was no brew house nor tavern, that he did not visit with his entertainment, where any merry barmaid was. But to say the truth, he was somewhat squeamish, about farting, and fastidious in his speech. This Absalom, who was elegant and gay, goes with a censor on the holiday, sensing the wives of the parish eagerly, and many a lovely look he cast on them, and especially on this carpenter's wife. To look on her he thought a merry life. She was so attractive and sweet and flirtatious. I dare well say, if she had been a mouse, and he a cat, he would have grabbed her at once. This parish clerk, this elegant Absalom, has in his heart such a love longing, that of no wife took he any offering. For courtesy, he said, he would have none. The moon, when it was night, very brightly shone, and Absalom his guitar has taken, for the sake of love he intended to stay awake, and forth he goes, elegant and amorous, until he came to the carpenter's house, a little after Cox had crowed, and took his place up by a casement window, that was upon the carpenter's wall, he sings in his voice gentle and high, now, dear lady, if it be thy will, I pray you that you will have pity on me, very well in harmony with his guitar playing. This carpenter awoke, and heard him sing, and spoke unto his wife, and said at once, What? Alison! Hearest thou not Absalom? That chance thus next to our bedroom's wall. And she answered her husband immediately, Yes indeed, God knows, John, I hear it every bit. This goes on, what more would you have? From day to day this elegant Absalom, so woos her that he is in a sorry state. He stays awake all the night and all the day. He combs his flowing locks, and dressed himself elegantly. He woos her by go-betweens and agents, and swore he would be her own servant. He sings, trilling like a nightingale. He sent her sweetened wine, mead, and spiced ale, and wafers, piping hot out of the fire, and, because she was a townie, he offered money, for some folk will be won for riches, and some by force, and some for noble character. Sometimes, to show his agility and skill, he plays Herod upon a high stage. But what good does it do him in this case? She so loves this clever Nicholas, that Absalom may go whistle. He had for his labor nothing but scorn, and thus she makes Absalom her fool, and turns all his earnestness into a joke. Very true is this proverb, it is no lie. Men say right thus, always the nearby sly one, makes the distant loved one to be disliked. For though Absalom be crazed or angry, because he was far from her sight, this nearby Nicholas cast him in the shadow. Now bear thyself well, thou clever Nicholas, for Absalom may wail and sing alas. And so it happened on a Saturday. This carpenter was gone to Ozenay and clever Nicholas and Alison are agreed on this plan, that Nicholas shall devise a trick, to beguile this hapless jealous husband, and if it so be the game went right, she should sleep in his arms all night, for this was his desire and hers also, and right away, without more words, this Nicholas no longer would tarry, but has carried very quietly unto his chamber, both food and drink for a day or two and told her to say to her husband, if he asked about Nicholas, 
she should say she knew not where he was. Of all that day she saw him not with eye. She believed that he was ill. Because, for no shout could her maid call him. He would not answer for anything that might befall. This goes on all that same Saturday. That Nicholas still in his chamber lay. And ate and slept, or did what he pleased. Until Sunday, when the sun goes to rest. This hapless carpenter has great marvel. About Nicholas, or what thing might ail him. And said, I am afraid, by Saint Thomas. Things are not right with Nicholas. God forbid that he should suddenly die. This world is now very ticklish, surely. I saw today a corpse carried to church. That's just now, on last Monday, I saw him work. Go up, he said unto his servant at once. Call at his door, or knock with a stone. Look how it is, and tell me quickly. This servant goes up very resolutely. And at the chamber door while he stood. He cried and knocked as if he were crazy. What, hey? What do you, Master Nicoly? How can you sleep all the long day? But all for naught, he heard not a word. He found a hole, very low upon a board. Where the cat was accustomed to creep in. And through that hole he looked in very carefully. And at the last he had a sight of him. This Nicholas sat ever gaping upward. As if he were gazing on the new moon. Down he goes, and told his master immediately. In what condition he saw this same man. This carpenter began to bless himself. And said, Help us, Saint Freed's wide. A man knows little what shall happen to him. This man is fallen, because of his astronomy. In some madness or in some fit. I always thought well how it should be. Men should not know of God's secrets. Yes, blessed be always an unlearned man. Who knows nothing but only his belief. So fared another clerk with astronomy. He walked in the fields to look. Upon the stars, to find, there what should happen. Until he was fallen in a fertilizer pit. He did not see that. But yet, by Saint Thomas. I feel very sorry for clever Nicholas. He shall be scolded for his studying. If that I may, by Jesus, heaven's king. Get me a staff, that I may pry up from below. While thou, Robin, lift up the door. He shall, come, out of his studying, as I guess. And to the chamber door he turned his attention. His servant was a strong fellow for this purpose. And by the hasp he heaved it off at once. Onto the floor the door fell straightway. This Nicholas at ever as still as stone. And ever gaped upward into the air. This carpenter supposed he was in despair. And seized him by the shoulders vigorously. And shook him hard, and cried loudly. What? Nicoly. What? How? What? Look down. Awake, and think on Christ's passion. I bless thee from elves and from evil creatures. There with the night charm he said straightway. On four corners of the house about. And on the threshold of the door outside. Jesus Christ, and Saint Benedict. Bless this house from every wicked creature. For evil spirits of the knights, the white pater noster. Where went thou, Saint Peter's sister? And at the last this clever Nicholas. Began to sigh deeply, and said, Alas! Shall all the world be lost right now? This carpenter answered, What sayest thou? What? Think on God, as we do, men who work. This Nicholas answered, Fetch me drink. And after will I speak in private. About a certain matter that concerns me and thee. I will tell it to no other man, certainly. This carpenter goes down, and comes again. And brought of strong ale a large quart. And when each of them had drunk his part. This Nicholas shut fast his door. And the carpenter sat down by him. He said, John, my host, beloved and dear. Thou shalt upon thy pledged word swear to me here that to no person thou shalt this counsel reveal. For it is Christ's secrets that I say. And if thou tell it to any one, thou art completely lost. For this vengeance thou shalt have therefore, that if thou betray me, thou shalt go mad. Nay, Christ forbid it, for his holy blood. Said then this hapless man, I am no blabbermouth. And, though I say it, I do not like to gab. Say what thou will, I shall never tell it to child nor wife, by him that rescued souls from hell. Now John, said Nicholas, I will not lie. I have found in my astrology. 
as I have looked on the bright moon, that now on Monday next, after midnight, shall fall a rain, and that so wild and raging, that Noah's flood was never half so large. This world, he said, in less than an hour, shall all be drowned, so hideous is the shower, thus shall mankind drown, and lose their lives. This carpenter answered, Alas, my wife, and shall she drown? Alas, my Alisoon! For sorrow of this he almost fell down, and said, Is there no remedy in this case? Why, yes indeed, by God, said clever Nicholas, if thou wilt act in accordance with learning and, good, advice, thou mayst not act according to thine own ideas. For thus says Salomon, which was very true, Do all in accordance with good advice, and thou shalt not rue it. And if thou wilt act in accordance with good advice, I guarantee, without mast and sail, yet shall I save her and thee and me. Hast thou not heard how Noah was saved, when our Lord had warned him before, that all the world should be destroyed by water? Yes indeed, said this carpenter, very long ago. Hast thou not heard, said Nicholas, also, the sorrow of Noah with his fellowship, before he could get his wife onto the ship? He would rather, I dare well guarantee, at that time, than have all his black sheep, that she had had a ship for herself alone. And therefore, knowest thou what is best to do? This needs haste, and of a hasty thing. Men may not preach nor make tarrying. Right now go bring us quickly into this dwelling. A kneading trough, or else a large vat. For each of us, but see that they be large. In which we may float as in a barge and have their insufficient victuals, But for a day, fie on the remnant. The water shall recede and go away. About nine a.m. on the next day. But Robin, thy knave, may not know of this. And also thy maid guy I cannot save. Ask not why, for though thou ask me, I will not tell God's secrets. It suffices thee, unless thy wits go mad. To have as great a grace as Noah had. Thy wife shall I well save beyond doubt. Go now thy way, and speed thee on this business. But when thou hast, for her and thee and me, got us these three kneading tubs, then shalt thou hang them in the roof very high, in a way that no man may espy our preparations. And when thou thus hast done as I have said, and hast laid our victuals carefully in them, and also an axe to smite the cord in two, when the water comes, so that we may go, and break a hole on high, upon the gable, toward the garden, over the stable, that we may freely pass forth on our way. When the great shower is gone away, then shalt thou float as merry, I guarantee, as does the white duck after her drake. Then will I call, How, Alison? How, John? Be merry, for the flood will soon pass. And thou will say, Hail, Master Nicoly. Good morrow, I see thee well for it is day, and then shall we be lords all our life, of all the world, like Noah and his wife. But of one thing I warn thee very sternly, be well advised on that same night, on which we are entered on to shipboard, that not one of us speak a word, nor call, nor cry, but be in his prayer, for it is God's own dear command. Thy wife and thou must hang far apart, so that between ye shall be no sin no more in looking than there shall be indeed. This ordinance is said. Go, God give thee success. Tomorrow at night, when people are all asleep, into our kneading tubs will we creep, and sit there, awaiting God's grace. Go now thy way, I have no more time, to make of this any longer preaching. Men say thus, send the wise, and say nothing. Thou art so wise, one needs not teach thee. Go, save our life, and that I beseech thee. This hapless carpenter goes forth his way. Very often he said alas and woe is me. And to his wife he told his secret. And she was aware, and knew it better than he, what all this ingenious scheme meant. But nonetheless she acted as if she would die, and said, alas? Go forth thy way quickly. Help us to escape, or we are dead each one of us. I am thy faithful, truly wedded wife. Go, dear spouse, and help to save our lives. Lo, what a great thing is emotion! One can die of imagination. 
so deeply may a mental image be taken, this hapless carpenter begins to tremble. He thinks truly that he can see, Noah's flood come surging like the sea, to drown Alisoon, his honey dear. He weeps, wails, looks wretched. He sighs with very many a sorry groan. He goes and gets him a kneading trough, and after that a tub and a large vat. And secretly he sent them to his dwelling, and hanged them in the roof secretly. With his own hand he made three ladders, to climb by the rungs and the uprights, unto the tubs hanging in the beams, and provisioned them, both trough and tub, with bread, and cheese, and good ale in a jug, sufficing just enough for a day. But before he had made all this preparation, he sent his servant, and also his servant girl, upon his business to go to London. And on the Monday, when it drew toward night, he shut his door without candlelight, and prepared everything as it should be. And shortly, up they climbed all three. They sat still a good two and one half minutes. Now, Pater Noster, quiet, said Nicoly, and quiet, said John, and quiet, said Alisoon. This carpenter said his devotion, and still he sits, and says his prayer, awaiting the rain, if he might hear it. The dead sleep, for weary business, fell on this carpenter right, as I guess, about curfew time, or a little more. For suffering of his spirit he groans deeply, and also he snores, for his head lay wrong. Down on the ladder stalks Nicoly, and Alisoon very quietly down she sped. Without more words they go to bed, where the carpenter is accustomed to lie. There was the revel, and the sounds of festivity, and thus lie Alison and Nicholas, in business of mirth and of pleasure, until the bell of the early morning service began to ring, and friars in the chapel began to sing, This parish clerk, this amorous Absalom, that is for love always so woebegone, upon the Monday was at Ozenai, with company, to be merry and amuse himself, and by chance asked a cloistered monk, very discreetly about John the carpenter, and he drew him apart out of the church, and said, I know not, I have not seen him working here, since Saturday, I suppose that he is gone, for timber, where our abbot has sent him, for he is accustomed to go for timber, and dwell at the granary a day or two, or else he is at his house, certainly, where he may be, I can not truly say. This Absalom very was jolly and happy, and thought, now is time to stay awake all night, for surely I saw him not stirring, about his door, since day began to spring. As I may prosper, I shall, at Cock's Crow, very quietly knock at his window, that stands very low upon his bedroom's wall. To Alison now I will tell all, my love longing, for yet I shall not miss that at the very least I shall her kiss. Some sort of comfort shall I have, by my faith. My mouth has itched all this long day. That is a sign of kissing at the least. All night I dreamed also I was at a feast. Therefore I will go sleep an hour or two, and all the night then will I stay awake and play. When the first cock has crowed, about midnight, at once, up rises this elegant lover Absalom, and dresses himself handsomely, in every detail but first he chews cardamom and licorice, to smell sweet, ere he had combed his hair. Under his tongue he had a true love herb, for thus he thought he would be gracious. He goes to the carpenter's house, and he stands still under the casement window. Unto his breast it reached, it was so low, and softly he coughs with a gentle sound. What do you, honeycomb, sweet Alisoon, my fair bird, my sweet cinnamon, Awake, sweetheart mine, and speak to me. Well little you think upon my woe, that for your love I sweat wherever I go. No wonder is though that I swelter and sweat. I mourn as does a lamb after the tit. Indeed, sweetheart, I have such love longing, that like a true turtle dove is my mourning. I can eat no more than a maiden. Go from the window, you idiot, she said. So help me God, it will not become kiss me. I love another, and else I were to blame. Well better than thee, by Jesus, Absalom. Go forth thy way, or I will cast a stone. And let me sleep, in the name of twenty devils. Alas, said Absalom, and woe is me. 
that true love was ever in such miserable circumstances. Then kiss me, since it can be no better. For Jesus' love, and for the love of me. Wilt thou then go thy way with that? Said she. Yes, certainly, sweetheart, said this Absalom. Then make thee ready, said she, I come right now. And unto Nicholas she said quietly, Now hush, and thou shalt laugh all thy fill. This Absalom set himself down on his knees, and said, I am a lord in every way. For after this I hope there comes more. Sweetheart, thy grace, and sweet bird, thy mercy. The window she undoes, and that in haste. Get done with it, said she, come on, and hurry up. Lest our neighbors espy thee. This Absalom wiped his mouth very dry. Dark was the night as pitch, or as the coal. And at the window out she put her hole. And Absalom, to him it happened no better nor worse. But with his mouth he kissed her naked ass. With great relish, before he was aware of this. Back he jumped, and thought it was amiss. For well he knew a woman has no beard. He felt a thing all rough and long-haired. And said, Fie! Alas! What have I done? T. Said she, and clapped the window to. And Absalom goes forth walking sadly. A beard, a beard? Said clever Nicholas. By God's body, this goes fair and well. This hapless Absalom heard every bit. And on his lip he began for anger to bite. And to himself he said, I shall pay thee back. Who rubs now, who now scrubs his lips? With dust, with sand, with straw, with cloth, with chips. But Absalom, who says very often, Alas! My soul I entrust to Satan. If I would not rather than, half, all this town, said he, be avenged for this insult. Alas, said he, alas, I did not turn away. His hot love was cold and all extinguished. For from that time that he had kissed her ass, lovemaking he thought not worth not a watercress. For he was healed of his malady. Very often he did renounce lovemaking, and wept as does a child that is beaten. At a slow pace he went down the street, to a smith man called Dan Gervais, who in his forge made plowing equipment. He sharpens plowshares and plow blades busily. This Absalom knocked all gently, and said, Open up, Gervais, and that right now. What, who art thou? It am I, Absalom. What, Absalom? For Christ's sweet cross. Why rise you so early? A, eh, bless me. What ails you? Some pretty girl, God knows it, hath brought you to be running around like this. By Saint Note, you know well what I mean. This Absalom cared not a bean. For all his joking, no word he gave in reply. He had more business on hand. Than Gervais knew, and said, Friend so dear. That hot plough blade in the hearth here. Lend it to me, I have something to do with it. And I will bring it back to thee very soon. Gervais answered, Certainly, were it gold. Or in a sack countless silver coins. Thou shouldest have it, as I am true smith. A, Christ's foe. What will you do with it? Concerning that, said Absalom, be as be may. I shall well tell it to thee tomorrow, and caught the plough blade by the cold handle. Very softly out at the door he began to steal, and went unto the carpenter's wall. He coughs first, and knocks then. Upon the window, just as he did before. This Alison answered, Who is there? That knocks so. I swear it is a thief. Why, nay, said he, God knows, my sweet beloved. I am thy Absalom, my darling. Of gold, said he, I have brought thee a ring. My mother gave it to me, as God may save me. Very fine it is, and also nicely engraved. This will I give thee, if thou kiss me. This Nicholas was risen to piss, and thought he would make the joke even better. He should kiss his ass before he escapes. And he opened up the window hastily, and he puts out his ass stealthily, over the buttock, to the thigh, and then spoke this clerk, this Absalom. Speak, sweet bird, I know not where thou art. This Nicholas immediately let fly a fart, as great as if it had been a thunderbolt, so that with the stroke he was almost blinded, and he was ready with his hot iron, and he smote Nicholas in the middle of the ass. Off goes the Skinner hand's breadth about.
The hot plow blade so burned his rump, and for the pain he thought he would die. As if he were crazy, for woe he began to cry, Help! Water! Water! Help! For God's heart! This carpenter woke suddenly out of his slumber, and heard someone cry water, as if he were crazy, and thought, Alas, now comes Noel's flood. He sits up without more words, and with his axe he smote the cord in two, and down goes all, he found nothing to sell, wasted no time, neither bread nor ale, until he came to the pavement, upon the floor, and there he lay in a swoon. Up started Alison and Nicoly, and cried out and help in the street. The neighbors, both low-ranking and high, run into gawk at this man, who yet lay in a swoon, both pale and wan, for with the fall he had broken his arm, but he had to stand up for himself, though it went badly, for when he spoke, he was immediately put down, by clever Nicholas and Alisoon. They told everyone that he was crazy, he was so afraid of Noel's flood, because of his imagination that in his foolishness, he had bought himself three kneading tubs, and had hanged them in the roof above, and that he begged them, for God's love, to sit in the roof, to keep him company. The folk did laugh at his foolishness, into the roof they stare and they gape, and turned all his harm into a joke. For whatever this carpenter answered, it was for naught, no one listened to his explanation. With oaths great he was so sworn down, that he was considered crazy in all the town. For every clerk immediately agreed with the other. They said, The man is crazy, my dear brother. And every person did laugh at this strife. Thus screwed was this carpenter's wife. In spite of all his guarding and his jealousy, and Absalom has kissed her lower eye, and Nicholas is scalded in the rump, this tale is done, and God save all this company. Here ends the miller's tale.